So I invite you to turn with me in God's Word, page 1720 in your pew Bibles, and that's Acts, at least I hope it is, Acts chapter 16. Page 1720, Acts chapter 16. For those who may be guests, we have been walking through the book of Acts for quite a while now, uh, just this fall looking at uh, the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. And uh, Acts chapter 16 sort of marks the beginning of Paul's second missionary journey. Um, Something we should probably take note of is that this is also a time when uh, Paul had been traveling with his uh, missionary partner Barnabas. Those two have parted ways at this point. Barnabas has gone off now to Cyprus with Mark, who we think is John Mark. And uh, Paul now takes on the partners of uh, Silas and Timothy. And this, again, is the beginning of of Paul's second missionary journey. And uh, we can put the map up at this point. And um, way uh, sort of in the middle of the screen, you see see where the journey begins once again in Antioch. And then uh, we're going to be moving west, and you'll see this this path headed straight um, northwest. And that's what we're going to be talking about Um, this morning. So what's going to happen is I'm going to read part of our text, and then we're going to pause, and I'll talk a little bit about that, and then we'll finish reading the text. So let's begin Acts 16, beginning with verse 6, and I hope you'll follow along in your Bibles. Keep them open um, as I read. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man um, of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, um, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And uh, here we're going to pause for a few moments. Um, So friends in, in Christ, my high school geometry class taught me that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Maybe you learned the same thing. But I am not sure that the Holy Spirit ever learned that. And I don't mean that flippantly or to um, demean the Holy Spirit in any way. What I'm trying to get at is the Holy Spirit doesn't seem to honor straight lines or to travel in straight lines. Let's take Luke's little uh, travel log here as, as example number one. So we start out going over the tip of the Mediterranean Sea here on the east shore of the Mediterranean, and Paul is sort of revisiting a couple of those cities where he has already planted churches, Lystra, Derbe, and it seems like when they get to Iconium, their plan is then to head straight west to Ephesus, which is a large city at the time right on the eastern shore of the Aegean Sea. That seems to be the plan, but the Holy Spirit says, no, don't want you going there. So plan B seems to be instead, well, we're going to travel north because we're going to head toward the Black Sea and there are populous areas up there. We'll travel, we'll preach the gospel, we'll plant more churches. And it seems like they actually get most of the way there. And again, the Holy Spirit says, No, don't want you going here either. And so what happens instead is they end up traveling this path as best we can tell, and we don't know for sure where it was exactly, but it's it's sort of straight northwest, and they end up again on the eastern shore of the Aegean Sea, but this time in Troas, which is much farther north than Ephesus ever was. That's where they end up, in Troas, just before they're called into Philippi. Now, let me just ask you, as you think about your own life and the leading of the Holy Spirit, have you ever experienced this sort of thing? Where, where you were 
you were convinced that the Holy Spirit was leading you in one direction, leading you to do one thing, perhaps to visit one place, and on your way there, all of a sudden, no, no, this isn't the way I want you to go. Or maybe there was a plan B, and you said, well, you know, door A is open for me, and so you headed toward that door, and as you were just about to open it, the Holy Spirit closed it said, no, there's no open door here. I want you someplace else. You know, all of those extra miles that were traveled by the mission team, can you imagine how frustrated they must have been? How perplexed they must have been? Why did we have to go through this? Why did we have to go here if the Holy Spirit meant us to be somewhere else in the first place? There had to be a shorter way to get here. There had to be a straight line to follow, but that wasn't the way that we traveled. Have you ever felt that kind of frustration? Have you ever felt that kind of perplexity? Luke and Julia, you know anything about that? Door A, closed. Door B, well, let's try that one. What is Luke perhaps telling us with this brief travel, travelogue? Well, a couple things. Um, one of them I think he may be saying is that following the Holy Spirit can be a very circuitous experience, a circuitous adventure. Second thing, just because we like straight lines, just because we like traveling straight from point A to point B and all of our highways are pretty much structured in that same way, it doesn't mean that God doesn't like taking the scenic route. Okay? Don't confuse those things. That if, if you can't follow the straight line, it must not be God leading you. Don't confuse those things. Last thing it's more important that we end up where we need to be than where we think we're supposed to be or where we want to be. It's more important that we end up where we need to be. Now, discerning God's will, like I said, can be a frustrating thing, but I think there are some clues here already in our text as to, you know, how we go about that, the kinds of, of things we should be looking for Number one is remember that God's revealed plan is always primary. God's revealed plan is primary. And, and we know, we understand God's revealed plan. And, and his plan in, in the book of Acts is, is right up in front. He says, you will be my witnesses because I'm going to carry the gospel from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses in that task. Paul and Silas, they, they understand that. Okay? You can look at verse 6. They see their role. What's their role? Preach the word. Verse 7, preach the gospel. They understand that that's what their calling is in that primary will, revealed will of Jesus Christ. He's bringing his gospel to the ends of the earth. Their role in that is to preach it. Second, besides understanding that revealed will of God, we have to understand that we follow a person and not a plan. We follow a person. If you read through those verses that I just read again, it's very clear that the Holy Spirit is leading this mission, right? He tells them, no, don't want you to go here. No, don't want you to go here. But we don't read anything about how, how he tells them that, or how they discern that. We don't know if it was a dream. We don't know if there's a prophecy behind this. We don't know if there was a literal road close sign. We don't know if it was a feeling. We don't know if someone got sick. We don't know if they had a series of, of prayer meetings to try and figure this out. We don't know any of that. All we know is that the Holy Spirit was there and was leading them. And so what it's up to us is to know the Holy Spirit. We get to know him through his word, and then we have to trust the Holy Spirit. Okay? Know the Spirit, trust the Spirit. Third, knowing God's will is a corporate endeavor. You can't figure it out by yourself. Paul has a vision, right? A man from Macedonia saying, come over here. We need you. We need you here. 
But we don't read that then Paul immediately gathered up his team and he headed to Macedonia. What we read is they got together and they concluded together. Okay? They got together and they talked about this vision. Is this from God? Do we know? How do we know? All of those kinds of things. They got together with the community of God's people. And friends, here's something we have to understand. When we're trying to determine God's will for our lives, we get together with other Christians, but it's other Christians who have to understand the primary will of God. All right? If they don't understand that Jesus Christ is king and we are servants of his, that Jesus Christ is taking his gospel to the ends of the earth and calling us to be a part of that, if they don't understand that, they're not the ones that you want to gather around you to try and determine God's will for your own life. It's a communal task, but it's for a community of people who are filled with the Holy Spirit themselves. The fourth thing, this is an active task, understanding the will of God. It's active, it's not passive. Again, there's a dream and you would think, well, that's pretty obvious. But this word is we got together and we concluded. What that means is, is we put the puzzle pieces together. We had to think about this. We had to analyze this. Okay? We had to want to know what God's will really is and put some work into discerning that will. It's an active thing. And finally, you have to trust that God knows what he's doing. You got to trust that God knows what he's doing. Because there can be a lot of pain along the way, right? You can end up in places you never thought you were going to end up in before. And you may not know the reason why. It may not make any sense to you at all. And so you have to trust. You have to trust that the Lord knows what he's doing. We can look at this text and say, well, you know, why did they have to travel all the way to Troas? Theologians have put forth at least one answer. One of them is in verse 10, you might notice that, that the pronouns change. Luke has been reporting all that's happened in the third person until we get to this verse. And here he says, after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave. Luke is inserting himself into the story. All of a sudden, he is a part of the team himself. What theologians believe is that Luke was actually in Troas. And this team got there at just the right time, just the right place to join up with Luke. And Luke became a part of this mission team. Luke wrote the gospel, the third gospel of Jesus Christ. Luke wrote the book of Acts, probably responsible for far more conversions even than the Apostle Paul. But can we be sure that's the reason? Is that definite reason for why the Holy Spirit brought them this route, brought them at this time to Troas? No. No. It's something that we have to trust God that he knows. Now, let's look at the rest of our text this morning. Because Luke is now going to move from geography to story, from big picture to detail. And let's see if this is what we've talked about so far, if we see that this is true in, in real life as well. So let's pick it up with verse 11. Uh, verse 11. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of the district of Macedonia. We stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we were outside the city gate at the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message, and when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. 
She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he finally turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, verse 11, we are now in Philippi. Okay, We are now in Macedonia where they have been called in that vision. And, uh, and Luke tells us here about three conversions. Three conversions. All right? The story begins with a prayer meeting, and it begins with a prayer meeting just outside of Philippi, along a, a riverbank, it seems. It sounds like a nice, quiet place, the kind of place uh, you would want to have a prayer meeting, right? A very pastoral setting. Maybe it even had the nickname of something like Brookfield. Um, sounds like a really nice place, and it, it sounds like a very positive experience also, doesn't it? Um, the mission team shares the gospel. God opens the heart of Lydia, who is one of the listeners. She responds, and she and her whole family are baptized, and we have the beginnings of a new congregation. It's a very nice story. It's pretty straightforward, and I think it's sort of how we think missions ought to work. Now, if this was you... Think about this. What do straight liners like us think about doing next? I mean, what's God's will from here? We know that the big story, right, is to continue to proclaim the gospel. So what do we do next? Well, I think that us straight liners feel like, hey, if we have success practicing one model of ministry, what do we do? We do it again, right? Wash, rinse, and repeat. Wash, rinse, and repeat. Let's do it again. And that's exactly what they do, right? Verse 16, they head off to another prayer meeting. In fact, Luke calls it the prayer meeting. And when he says they're going to the prayer meeting, what do we kind of assume? Well, we assume that it's, it's a continuation of the first prayer meeting, right? It's a repeat of the first prayer meeting. They're going back to that, to that nice quiet riverbank. They're going to join with the same people, the God worshipers, and they're going to have a nice prayer meeting where they declare the gospel, and as a result, some more people respond and are baptized, and it's a wonderful sort of thing. The prayer meeting. 
But just note here, friends, that this time Luke doesn't tell us anything about this prayer meeting. He doesn't say where it happens or when it happens or who's there. He just says they're headed to the prayer meeting. Okay, so we assume that basically we are following a straight line. But this is where things go all cattywampus on us because these circumstances don't follow a straight line at all. Before we ever get to the prayer meeting or before Paul and Silas get to that prayer meeting, they are met by a slave girl who's possessed by an evil spirit. And from here, the path of our missionaries spirals right down into the very nest of the devil himself. And here, friends, Luke begins to show us one of the reasons why the Holy Spirit does not always travel in a straight line. And the reason is because of the complexity of evil in this world. The complexity of evil and all that the gospel seeks to unravel and set right. First of all, let's look at the kind of evil we're dealing with here. All right? First, we're dealing with the spirit world. And while we and our neighbors, especially at this time of year, try to make a big joke out of this, Luke is telling us that this isn't funny. That we're talking about spiritual enslavement here. And apart from Christ, that's who we are. We are, we are people who are enslaved by the devil. In fact, our translation here indicates that, that this girl um, could predict the future. And, and that's rather a, a rather cursory interpretation of what's really happening here. The Greek text indicates that she was a pythoness, or that she had a pythonic spirit. Now, we're talking about the python, the snake here, right? And in classical mythology, the python um, stood at the, the temple gate of the god of Apollo at Delphi. And Apollo was actually known for giving oracles, for telling people what was going to happen in the future. And so in short, this girl was actually believed to be channeling the voice of Apollo. Okay? And that's why some interpreters actually will say that she was a ventriloquist, because it wasn't her own voice that was coming out of her. It's something straight out of the exorcist, right? Where the, where the demons are actually using her voice and speaking their message. This is, this, is, this is a really sad thing that's going on here. It's about possession. It's about spiritual enslavement. But friends, that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, I mean, look at our text here. Look at some of the things that are going on. She's a slave, literally, not just spiritually. She's a literal slave. And she is being exploited by her owners who are controlling everything that she does. She has no control over herself. She's not a willing participant in this. Next, there's money involved. Money. Money is a driving force here. You know that because nobody really cares about this girl. Nobody celebrates when she's freed from this spirit by Paul. There aren't a bunch of friends who gather around here and, and celebrate her freedom. They're miffed, right? Because their source of income has just dried up. There's also anti-Semitism that's going on here. Um, the slave owners, they don't just accuse Paul and Silas and his team of, of throwing the city into chaos. What they say is, these Jews are throwing the city into chaos. As if this is the kind of thing that Jews always do. Friends, when you put all of these things together, okay, there is a power that seems to take, to take over. Um, take a look at this jailer for a moment. On the surface, he's just a guy. He's just a man who's trying to do his job, right? His job is to throw people in jail, to watch them, that sort of thing. He's just a guy doing his job. But at a deeper level, at a deeper level, friends, it's more than that, isn't it? It's more than that. He's someone who's controlled by the slave owner's lust for money. 
They make a fuss, and the politicians fall in line, and before you know it, Paul and Silas are stripped, they're beaten, they're flogged, they're locked away. And the jailer may just be doing his job, but in reality, he's doing the will of the devil. And he's protecting a system and powers that he may not even see or understand. Somebody once put it this way about the jailer. They said, just because you hold the keys to somebody else's cell does not mean that you yourself are free. Just because you hold the keys to somebody else's cell does not mean that you yourself are free. Each of those sins we can look at, right? Anti-Semitism, slavery, the power of money, each of those things is bad enough on its own. But when you put them all together, when you combine them, this is the kind of thing that happens. We end up serving a master that we can't see, we don't know, we don't understand, and we end up in an adversarial position to our own God. Can that really happen to us? Well, let's think about it. Just think about social media for a few seconds, right? Teenagers, there is overwhelming research that you are being manipulated on social media. I mean, very smart people are taking advantage of your need to to know and be known, to love and to be loved. They're taking advantage of that. Why are they doing it? Why don't they stop? Why doesn't someone in authority make them stop? Because every time you click, somebody is making money. And because somebody is making money, they're going to keep trying to manipulate you and keep trying to get you to do what they want you to do. There is power in money. Money is a god. It keeps us from clear thinking. It keeps us from asking the right questions. It keeps us from doing things doing things that we want to do. And it makes us do things that we don't want to do. Just like the jailer who ends up doing things that he doesn't even know or understand that he's doing. Look at verse 21 for a moment. The accusers here of Paul and Silas, they say, they are advocating customs unlawful for us Romans. What are they talking about there? Well, there were actually laws in Roman society that outlawed any practice of of religion or cults that were not sanctioned by the state. Okay, if you were not sanctioned by the state, your religion was outlawed. And so what they are saying here is that Roman religion sanctioned slavery, exploitation, anti-Semitism, prejudice, racism, all of that stuff was sanctioned by Roman religion. And any religion that didn't sanction the same stuff should be outlawed, should be illegal, was bad for society, and should be punished. Does that remind you of any other society? In other words, these people recognize that the gospel of Jesus Christ was aimed at the very heart of their way of life, at the very heart of the status quo of their society, at the heart of all their assumptions about people and who had worth and who did not, who could be exploited, who could not. They understood that God's will was out to destroy these powers and to free God's people. They understood that. Do we? Friends, evil in this world is complex. But the Holy Spirit will reveal it for what it is if we ask. And if we walk with the Holy Spirit, and if we listen 
to the Holy Spirit. And if we think and analyze and pray what it is that he's telling us and what it is that he wants us to do and how it is that he wants us to live, the Holy Spirit will show us these things. But we just have to be ready to leave the paved road to understand that things are not always going to go in a straight line. Which leads to our last point. And I'll try and be brief, and that is that God is greater than the complex evil around us. That even though evil is complex and it's out there, God is greater than that complexity of evil. And while the path he is leading us on may be surprising to us, he will lead us to exactly where we need to be. He will lead us to where we need to be. Let's just look at a few more things in this text. The big picture here, okay? The big picture. We said that there are three conversions that happen in, uh, in Philippi. Lydia, the slave girl, the jailer, right? There was a prayer that most Jewish men prayed just about every morning. It went something like this. God, I'm grateful that you have made me not a woman or a slave or a Gentile. I'm grateful that you have not made me a woman or a slave or a Gentile. Three categories. Three barriers, really, to what the gospel is doing in this world in establishing the kingdom of God. Three walls, three barriers that needed to be broken down. And we see this beginning to happen in Philippi. And we see it in surprising ways. Think first about Lydia, okay? What did Paul see in his vision? He saw a man from Macedonia saying, come here, come here and help. So Paul goes, he preaches the word, and who is the first person that God opens their heart and they believe and respond to the gospel? It's Lydia. It's a woman. It's a woman. Do you think that surprised Paul at all? Look at verse 15. <clears throat> Lydia tells this little group, if you consider me a believer, come and stay at my house. Now, why does she say that? Well, most commentators say, well, she's being hospitable, which she is, which is great. But why else is she saying that? Because it sounds very much like, like Peter and Cornelius, right? Peter preached the word to Cornelius. Cornelius believed, and then he said, uh, Peter, if you really believe the gospel that you're preaching to me, that we're saved by the, the blood of Jesus, by the grace of Jesus Christ, then come over to my house and stay with me and eat with me. Prove it that it's true. And it's like Lydia is doing the same thing here with Paul. If you guys believe that this gospel has saved me as well, then come and stay with me and prove it. And they do. And there are baptisms, and the whole household is saved, and one wall is broken down. Then there's the slave girl. Any surprises here? Well, for one, she's possessed by an evil spirit, but the spirit is basically shouting the truth. That, that Paul and Silas are telling the way to be saved through Jesus Christ. And maybe that's the reason it took Paul so long to cast this demon out. I mean, how is he supposed to know what to do? Holy Spirit, what do I do here? Are you giving me free advertising or, or what? But then we read something more. In verse 18, it says that Paul is troubled. Paul was troubled by what he was hearing. And the word here means that he was grieved and he was saddened. He couldn't stand to think of how this woman was being exploited and what was being done to her. And he knew that the Jesus Christ that he worshipped, he didn't allow this sort of thing in his kingdom, in his realm. And so Paul did what he believed the Holy Spirit was leading him to do and he cast out that demon. And she was free. And she was delivered. And wall number two fell down. 
And then there's the jailer. You see any surprises here? I think the biggest surprise is that Paul and company finally get to their second prayer meeting. The account begins with a prayer meeting next to a river, and it ends with a prayer meeting not next to a river, but in a prison. It's in a different place. And the prayer leaders, well, they're a little worse for wear, aren't they? This time they're beaten, they're flogged, they're, they're in pain. But they're still worshiping God. That's the one thing that remains the same. They're singing, they're praying, they're worshiping the living God, the God of Jesus Christ who sent them on this mission in the first place. God is with them. He closed the door to the river, but he opened the door to the prison. And they went through. Same God. And yet there are other differences as well, other little surprises. There are different listeners this time. It's not Lydia, it's not the God worshipers who are listening to Paul. Rather, the ones listening to the worship service this time are pagan criminals, the most Gentile of Gentiles. And there's also a different order of worship here in this prayer service, if you know. At the river, Paul spoke the word. Everything went in a straight line. He spoke the word. God opened Lydia's heart. Lydia responded. She was baptized, so on and so forth. Here, none of that happens in a straight line at all. In fact, God begins by opening the doors of the prison and breaking the chains. Not just literally, but spiritually. You wonder, you have to ask the question, why was it not just Paul that stayed in prison? Why did all the other prisoners hang out there when, when their chains fell off? I think Luke is telling us something more happened than literal chains off, falling off. He opened their hearts. That's what happens first, before Paul preaches. And the jailer, he doesn't respond to Paul's preaching of the gospel, to Paul's call to be saved. He asks how can I be saved? Before Paul preaches. Again, it's after that Paul preaches the gospel. Everything is out of order. It's like there's a huge door that's open. Like a vision of a man saying, come here and help. And it turns out Paul was exactly where he needed to be, wasn't he? And what was the confirmation of that? What's the confirmation of it all? That God is in this, that God is leading, that God is here. It's baptism. Lydia and her household, the jailer and his household, all of them are baptized and brought into the family of God. But friends, baptism is not just a sign of joining God's family. It's also a sign of a new world that is coming. The spiritual powers that distort and enslave and segregate and manipulate, they will not prevail. Every baptism is a sign that they will not prevail. That in the end, God's will will be done. It's a pretty nice end. A pretty good story. And we saw it again here today. Let's bow in prayer. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we thank you for the sign of baptism, which just preaches to us again that you are in control. You are moving things toward their rightful end the coming of your kingdom when all walls will be broken down in Jesus Christ and we will be one people together forever with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and with God our Father, the baptized community, your church. Your church and kingdom will be one and God, you will be praised forever and ever and we praise you now in Jesus' name, amen.